Hello, my friends. Today is March 8th, and this is Markets Weekly. So I'm recording this one day earlier. Now, this past week was a pretty volatile week in markets, and it looks like we're going to close Friday down again. I'm seeing a couple things in markets that suggest caution. First, I noticed that in the middle of the week, the Nikkei futures had a 3% intraday swing. Now, the Nikkei has been a huge leader in this global equity market rally, and it looks like it's stumbling a bit. Most importantly, on Friday, I saw NVIDIA, who is without doubt the leading general in this market rally, uh, tumble 10% intraday. So if the generals are getting tired, it, it to me suggests that maybe the market wants to pause a little bit. Guess we'll see how that turns out in the coming days. So today I wanna to talk about three things. First, we got to talk about gold. Now, gold is surging to all-time highs. Let's talk about some common theories that try to explain what drives gold. Secondly, the FDIC released its latest uh, U.S. banking sector banking profile, and it has a wealth of information on the U.S. banking sector. Let's see what the profile says. And lastly, Fed officials and the media have been talking about this brand new paper by some noted academics on QT. Let's see what the findings of the paper are. Okay, starting with gold. Now gold, if you look at a chart of gold prices, gold has basically gone up every single day the past year, past week, and it looks like it's going to the moon. It's absolutely surging. Now gold has always been something that's difficult to explain. At the end of the day, it's a shiny rock, it doesn't have earnings, it doesn't have profit, it doesn't have loss. So how do you know what to pay for it? There's, there've been some common theories. One popular theory was real interest rates. So after the great financial crises, we saw gold surge. And at that time, real interest rates were negative. So many people were thinking, well, you know, if you're getting negative real rates, you might as well buy something tangible instead of let your money burn away. Now, if you look at real interest rates today, say based on a 10-year tips, you can see that real interest rates uh, slightly below 2% and historically quite high. So this real interest rate explanation uh, doesn't work for the price surge. Um, what about money printing? No. After the great financial crisis, people were always very keen to say, well, the Fed is expanding their balance sheet, doing QE, so we got to buy gold. But of course, the Fed is doing QT and shrinking its balance sheet, so that doesn't work either. Uh, one other way of thinking about gold is as a currency. So in that case, well, how is the dollar trading? Looking at the broad Dixie, the dollar index, it looks like the dollar has been taking a bit of a tumble the past few weeks weakening notably against the euro and the pound. So, you know, maybe the weakness in the dollar has been one possible explanation for the surge in gold. Although, as you can see, you know, dollar has been weakening modestly, but the surge in gold is pretty exceptional. Now, another common lens in looking at gold is through the lens of geopolitics. Uh, gold is really unique in that it's an asset without a counterparty. Now, what does that mean? So if I have deposits at a bank, well, the bank is my counterparty and the bank could potentially default on me. For example, I could go to the bank, ask for my money, and the bank could say, sorry, I've, uh, I've uh, going bankrupt. I'm going to become like Silicon Valley Bank. Or maybe if I hold treasury securities, my counterparty is the US government, and maybe the US government doesn't like me, and so they decide to freeze my treasury securities. So gold is a good hedge against government. Now, if we are in a world with where increasing political instability, then I think gold is probably going to be an attractive asset, not necessarily for individuals, but definitely for governments. So one of the common stories we've been hearing over the past several months is that central banks, foreign central banks, have been buying gold. And we do have reports, say China, for example, uh, continuing to buy gold. And as we all know, they have trillions of US dollars and a relationship with the US that is sometimes tense. So it totally makes sense for them to buy some gold and maybe other sovereigns as well. Now the macro backdrop, as we 
I see, based on the most recent data, seems to suggest that the Fed is going to be cutting rates maybe as soon as June as well. So, you know, you do have this macro backdrop where we are in an easing cycle and you do have positive risk appetite. And if you look at an asset that some people think is related to gold, uh, some people call it digital gold, Bitcoin, you can see that Bitcoin has been surging to all time highs as well. So maybe there are traders who view these uh, assets as similar and are also piling into gold. Uh, in any case, oftentimes what happens is that the price moves and people explain a theory, uh, find a theory to explain it. So uh, from my perspective, uh, weakening dollar, well, not just weakening dollar, but all currencies weakening, as well as geopolitical risks, uh, to me, make suggests to me that gold probably has further to run uh, and maybe it could run up a lot in the coming years. It's just my personal view. Okay, secondly, let's talk about what the latest FDIC banking profile is saying. Now, as you recall, uh, last March, we had a panic in regional banks, which from my perspective has always been something that has been localized. And over the past year, I've been telling you guys in many videos that the U.S. banking sector is totally fine. It's just that we have 4,000 banks. And if you have 4,000 of anything, you're going to have some banks that have a tough time. And this re most recent quarterly uh, profile from the FDIC continues to affirm my beliefs. Now, first, let's look at the net interest mar margin for the commercial banking sector. As we all know, interest rates have gone up a lot. And some were expressing concern that, well, if the Fed is raising short interest so much, the banks are going to go bust because, well, they have their they have interest income on assets that are longer dated, but they have to pay interest on shorter dated liabilities. And that interest they pay has gone up a lot. So maybe they're getting squeezed. Maybe they'll go broke. But as you can see in this data broken down by uh, bank sizes, that's just not the case, and it's basically never been the case. So banks are sophisticated businesses. Uh, they manage their assets and liabilities well, such that when uh, their interest expense goes up, they also find ways to either hedge that or pass it on uh, to their borrowers. And so you can see over periods of time, the net interest rate margins of banks are relatively stable. Now, sometimes they do go up, Obviously, yeah, when uh, interest rates were zero, uh, that was right after COVID, that was a pretty good time for the banking sector. Um, but overall, these are guys who know what they're doing across bank sizes. So bank income actually has been totally fine. Now, last quarter, they had to pay that FDIC special assessment. Basically, the FDIC uh, lost a bunch of money bailing out some of the regional banks. And so uh, they imposed a special assessment on the bank system, banking system to make up for that. And so uh, fourth quarter of last year, the banking sector had to cough up some cash. But other than that, uh, their income ha has been good. Now let's go to credit. Now, again, we all hear many stories about stress in uh, credit, but you know, that's just straight up not true. Now, when a loan, uh, is goes bad first becomes non-current that is to say that uh, the buyer stops making its payments and at the end of the day through a process it finally gets charged off that is when the bank recognizes the loss now if you look at this chart of non-current and charge offs you can see that yeah it's been ticking up slightly but it's very much within historical ranges there is absolutely no credit concern as a whole in the banking sector of course, there could be individual banks that have some problem, but of course, if you have 4,000 small business, if you have 4,000 of any business, you're going to have uh, a few banks that are not well managed. But overall, as you can see, things look okay. Now, a common concern that people have been having is the commercial, uh, is the commercial real estate sector. So commercial real estate, as we must remember, is a wide sector that includes things like hospitals, includes data centers, multifamily, and of course, it also includes uh, office space. And we know office space, particularly in big cities, has not been doing well. Now, the FDIC has this chart that shows you basically 
how banks are faring on their, uh, I guess, commercial real estate portfolios. And overall, uh, it's really fine with the exception of one segment that is larger banks. Now, the FDIC gives additional information and says that this increase in concern from larger banks is really centered around office real estate in um, downtown areas. So again, very much uh, a problem that appears to be isolated. Um, uh, one other thing that I would note is that in the past, there has also been concern about the unrealized losses of the securities portfolio of commercial banks. Now, the, the latest FDIC data shows that uh, as rates rallied through the end of last year, there was a significant improvement in the securities portfolio of commercial banks, such that a lot of these losses uh, declined significantly. Again, when you look at this, you have to realize that you know, there's an asset side and also a liability side. If you have unrealized losses on your assets, you also got to look at the liabilities as well. Maybe the liabilities are also longer dated such that when interest rates go up, well, the market value of the liability declines as well. So if you have uh, smaller market values in assets and a smaller market values in liabilities, your net worth is unchanged. And I think that's what many people miss when they point to these unrealized losses. In any case, uh, as we can see, if you, uh, in the um, overall sense, uh, the banking system continues to be fine, and I expect it to continue to be going forward. Now, this past week, Chain Powell went on, uh, on the Hill and was subject to questioning by the House and the Senate. And one thing you'll notice is that over and over again, uh, the Congress people were asking Jay Powell about Basel III Endgame, which is a suite of new regulations. Now, it looks like Jay Powell is going to be adjusting those regulations going forward to make them a little bit less onerous because they are really onerous. And one way they can adjust that is to adjust how they treat the leverage ratio and treasury securities. And I think that's going to have a big impact on how the market functions. And that's what I will write about in my blog this week. And the last thing that I want to talk about is this latest QT paper by some noted academics. So we had Fed officials give speeches specifically in response to this, and we had many people in the media writing about it. Now, just what is this paper saying? Well, first off, this is an interesting paper in that it compares the QT experience across a number of countries. Now, QT has been a global phenomenon, and so having this kind of comparison it is pretty interesting. Now, what these scholars are trying to do is they're coming, try to come up with an event study to quantify the effect of QT on interest rates. Now, this is, uh, to be totally clear, there's no good way to do this. It's a really hard study to do. And so when we look at these results, we have to keep that in mind. It's you know, for reference only. So first off, as we notice, the QT is proceeding uh, across the world and more so in some countries than others. And it's also proceeding in different ways. Some countries, for example, are selling uh, their QE portfolio outright and other countries have been letting it passively roll off as is the case in the Fed. Now, the academics think that QT has a relatively small impact on yields. Now, across the country, across the world, you'll notice that um, they come up with different estimates as to how impactful QT is. Now, notice that they think that the impact of QT on U.S. yields is not very large. But we also have to keep in mind that it's very difficult to conduct this study as the authors admit. Now, in the U.S., for example, before QT was officially announced, you have all sorts of Fed speakers leaking details and hinting on this months in advance, such that when the announcement is officially unveiled, it's, uh, it's something the market already knows. In contrast, in other jurisdictions, QT was kind of a surprise. The central bank just basically jumped out and said, we're going to do QT. And that's what they found. They found that countries were uh, that tended to surprise the markets, had bigger impacts, and also countries that were outright selling their government bond holdings had bigger impacts as well. So 
QT has an impact, but according to the study, not a very large impact on rates. Now, the study also notes that QE seems to be much more impactful than QT. And this point was also directly addressed by a couple of Fed speakers. One thing important to note, though, is of course, QE and QT happen in very different contexts. When QE happens, it's oftentimes when things are going really, really bad. And so having the Fed step in at these moments is really a big morale booster. And of course, when the Fed steps in in these times, it's usually in size. So it should not be expected that um, QE and QT would be symmetric. After all, they occur in very different circumstances. Governor Waller had a very interesting illustration where he basically said, well, if your house is on fire and you douse a whole bunch of water on it to take out the fire, then when you take the water, when the water dries, would you expect the fire to come back? Uh, no, right? It's, uh, it's not symmetric. And so uh, you wouldn't expect QT and QE to have symmetric impacts. Now, that being said, we also have a very interesting commentary from the Twitter world showing that uh, one reason why QT and QE have uh, different degrees of impacts is because QE is historically much larger than QT. Uh, the Fed and central banks in general seem to be very risk averse. So uh, when, some, when it comes to loosening monetary policy, they're very, very aggressive. But when it comes to tightening monetary policy, eh, they, they, they are a bit more cautious. And this asymmetry is what the market understands and so they react much less to QT, keeping in mind that maybe QT could stop earlier than expected and that the Fed probably maybe isn't super serious anyway. Now we're getting more communications that suggest the Fed may actually be more serious uh, than we expect. And I wrote about that last week when I talked about how Governor Waller is envisioning a Fed portfolio, Fed Treasury portfolio that will have more bills suggesting more coupon roll-off even after QT ends. Um, so that's all I prepared for today. If you're interested in hearing more of my thoughts, check out my blog at feddie.com. And if you're interested in learning more about markets, check out my uh, online courses at centralbanking101.com. Thanks so much, and I'll talk to you guys next week.